Do you struggle with work-life balance? Who doesn't? Well, stick around because in this episode of the Mental Health Toolbox, we're talking all about work-life balance tips with co-author Lisa Newberger Fernandez on their new book, Rebalance, How Women Lead, Parent, Partner, and Thrive. In their new book, Monica Brand Engel, Lisa Newberger Fernandez, and Wendy Jagerson Taliki talk about what it takes to truly thrive full circle as purpose-driven leaders, parents, partners, and citizens. So let's go. Hey, are you getting value from this content? Well, if so, be sure to subscribe for the MHT newsletter if you haven't done so already. That way you get notified of all of the new episodes I put out as they're released, as well as access to all of the freebies I have waiting for you there. You can sign up using the link in the description. Well, hello, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining the Mental Health Toolbox. I appreciate you taking time to share with our audience your words of wisdom on work and life balance. Great to be here. Absolutely. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and this new book that you have put out with your cohorts on work and life balance? Yes, excellent. Well, Rebalance is our humble and often humorous take on how working parents, moms and dads can thrive while leaving very full lives while we're trying to raise good kids, be good partners find meaning in our work, make a difference in the world. And many days, it's just a struggle to get all the way through to bedtime. So that's that's what what the book is about. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? (laughs) I think any parent listening right now can relate to uh, the challenges of, quote, doing it all, right? Wearing all the hats. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We thought about that phrase, you know, can you have it all? And our general take on that topic is that you could have it all technically, but not all at the same time. Because something's got to give. We have this exercise in the book called the wheel, which mm-hmm. we can get into in a minute if you want. And and but in the wheel, you realize that we have so many different aspects of our life, and we have to prioritize and figure out where we really want to focus, what's really important for us right now. So it's a good exercise to help us to to find that focus. Absolutely. So yeah, I definitely want to dive into that. I'm all about, uh, I'm a very visual guy. So I love any kind of visual aid that can be uh, provided. Absolutely. Um, So tell me about this book. How did you guys uh, get into it? And when I say you guys, I'm referring to you, of course, Lisa, and then Monica Brand Engel and Wendy Jagerson Taliki. The three of you put this book together, right? It's the brainchild (laughs) of the three of you. Yes, apparently it's unusual to have three authors, um, but we we did this together. We kicked off the book during COVID, but the book is actually telling the tales from 10 years of conversations that the three of us were having with a whole group of women in Washington, D.C., who were part of this group that we called Thrive. And mm-hmm. the book, uh, sorry, the group actually kicked off in 2010 when I moved to D.C. from, from the Bay Area, and it was a new generation of a group that was actually started in the Bay Area even um, by a good friend named Ellen who created a a group called Momsy, Moms in Sustainability. And the concept there was we're all working in sustainability. We're all new moms with like infants. And how can we make our lives actually sustainable (laughs) without like driving off a cliff? These types of things. So we, you know, we've learned a few things along the way and we try to tell the stories that, that we've taken away from all of these years of conversations with uh, working moms and trying to, trying to find that balance. That's the best place really to, to, to get the feedback is in the trenches exactly. and from lived experience, right? You're speaking from lived experience and your cohort um, and just really speaking to the pain points, it sounds like, of, of what it's like to to try and navigate those waters, right? Of parenting and living with purpose and self-care and not not feeling guilty at the end of the day. I mean, I'm sure there's so much to unpack there. Yes, there there's a lot to unpack there. And that mom guilt, that's that's a topic we we definitely get into in the book. And the 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 mom guilt is something that 
actually was one of the inspirations for me to even want to write the book in the first place. So when COVID hit, I was taking a walk and talk with um, with one of the, the Thrive Women, and I was thinking, how is it that, um, that some of the women in this group have been able to accomplish so many things while living so thoughtfully in such a balanced manner? So one of the co-authors, Wendy, is, is kind of our prize um, for, for no, living with no guilt. And, mm. and I was really curious, like, how do you do it? You know, mm-hmm. what, how is it even possible? She's a mom with three kids and she travels, at least used to travel extensively for work with, with the World Bank. And she would leave on these these big, exciting trips, you know, without feeling the, those pangs of guilt, which I definitely felt every mm-hmm. time I was in a flyaway. And she explained to me that the way that she was brought up actually led to all this. So her mom was a single mom and she would often like go off into the garden and, and meditate or on the weekends go sailing. She was basically taking care of herself and she gave her kids the chance to take care of themselves and to be a bit more independent than um, than we may think of for, for our kids these days. And by doing that, her mom kind of gave her and her siblings this like the confidence to fly and the confidence to um to to be independent and she was able to go off and and live her life and kind of be that that role model so i love that story and i love her inspiration for mm-hmm. you know how to not feel guilty how to not give guilt to somebody else big big topic for working parents oh yes it sounds like i'm definitely a cornerstone of uh just your own mental health as a parent and so it also sounds like for for uh wendy this was a value that was instilled and modeled for her from a young age right because we t- in mental health this podcast is all about mental health as a therapist that's that's my jam and so we talk obviously a lot about the stories we tell ourselves that internal dialogue and the rules and assumptions that we live by right really frame our own expectations and how we feel about those expectations and outcomes a lot of it's self-imposed yeah yeah that kind of self-talk is something that's that can always be be in our head. And um, I remember working with a, a Zen um, Buddhist monk. I don't know if you can be both Zen and Buddhist, but let's say a Buddhist monk um, a couple of years ago, and he was telling us a similar story from from Wendy's mom. He said that he realized as when he got into his teenage year, young adult years that his mom would often like disappear when some kind of chaos was happening with him and his brothers. She would sort of like go in the other room, they would hear piano music, and then she would come back and she would (laughs) just be like happier. And he, at some point in his life, he got that realization that, that that was her way to like find some kind of mindfulness and find some kind of presence of mind. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that, that motivated him to go into, go into Buddhism and to find, you know, to follow these, these practices that in, in rebalance, we think that rebalancing itself is one of those practices, one of those uh, muscles that you can build over time. And we consciously chose the word rebalance because we, we see this as a dynamic activity. The, the title itself um, came from watching my daughter try to learn how to ride on a unicycle. And, you know, <laughs> if you've ever tried this. Have no, you, I have not tried, actually. <laughs> I, I haven't either. Well, I tried to feel like brown for second. those of you who don't who don't know me on a personal level. Yeah, exactly. It's very hard. It's very hard to get onto the to the unicycle, and it wants to fall over. You kind of keep keep falling over like time and time and time again. And when I was watching her do this one day, I just realized like that is the metaphor of our of our life. And not only trying to ride a unicycle as a working parent, but trying to ride a unicycle and like juggling all these things all the time. You know, your kids, your mm-hmm. relationship, your your work, your health, and and so that that was the image that that came into our mind. But this notion of rebalance as a as a dynamic activity, it's not perfect. It's not like the this like one place that you're going to get to. It's also a space of motion. You now you're in a constant motion, and if you can get the unicycle to actually stay upright and move forward, it's like you're the you're the you're the author. You've got control over over the situation. And that's the kind of thing. That kind of agency is is the one of these metaphors that one of these insights that we have kind of at the core 
of our book in terms of how do you thrive as a parent with all these different things going on? Like, how do you find that balance and recognizing that it's going to be a rebalance and you're going to you know, constantly mm-hmm. come, back to, come back to that center point? Sounds like a real uh, strength-based perspective, right? I like that. Um, yeah. At work, we switched several years ago from one form of performance management to the strengths, the Gallup Strengths Finders, and it was kind of a radical departure in a kind of a global multinational consulting firm with the kind of a very hierarchical skills-based approach to go from, you know, the the red light green light approach to mm-hmm. the to Strengths Finders, and and I love that approach where it says everybody has strengths, you need to find them, and if, mm-hmm. if as a as a company or as a family, like you allow people to play to those strengths, you will kind of get people into the flow and get so much more out of them. So I'm a big fan of that, that notion of, of human performance. Absolutely. And you, you touched on the, the notion of rebalancing, right? I love that depiction of the juggling on the, the unicycle, right? Because that's life. It's messy. It's not June Cleaver. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very um, play as you go, right? Exactly. Um, So this idea of rebalancing, right? So by that, you mean there's not like one set of absolute rules. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Because we all like that, right? We we all like, you know, give me the the silver bullet. Give me the the three, you know, bullet points of this is what I have to do and and everything will be gravy, right? Yeah. But life doesn't really work that way. Yeah, I don't think so either. At the core of our book is this notion of of the wheel. And we certainly didn't invent the wheel. Probably psychologists since the age of time have been using this this technique. But this is um, something I'm going to I'm going to just hold up. Thank you. Yes. Visuals. Like a really fancy wheel. But actually to draw the wheel, you don't even need such a colorful um, image. All you need is a piece of paper and a pen and you draw a circle and you think, what are the most important areas in my life right now? And just start writing them down like a list. And, you know, my health, my mental health, my kids, my spouse, my work, my mind, you know, my my mind space, all these kinds of things. Once you get a good list going, then you just count them up. And that's the number of slices in your wheel. So this one has 12. And this one has 12 because our book has 12 chapters, four sections. And that's kind of the, I love that. the chapters of our book and the way we think about it and like our wheel has has a fourth on on work one on family one on health and one on community that that's the way we think but the beauty of the wheel is that it's up to everyone to draw their own wheel based on wherever they are whatever is most important today at this moment and it's also the interesting part of the wheel is that you can redraw the wheel at any time. Like in the Thrive Group, we would go on annual retreats whenever we, when any year that we could. Sometimes we missed the annual retreat. We were just too busy. But And if you're somebody who likes to do the New Year's resolutions, that's a good time to do the wheel. Or if something big is happening in your life, like for example, me and my family, we're just about to move to Spain. We're moving continents. So this is a good time to, to do the wheel and think about your, your priorities. Or maybe once we get there and things get settled down. Um, but the other part of the wheel, once you have your, your sections and you're, you've got them drawn out, then you get to the really fun part, which is to shade from the center to the end and how satisfied you are in that part of your life. Mm. The the really cool thing is that this is your own personal scale. So the outside of your wheel is where you want to be, where you find satisfaction, not your mom, not your daughter, not your spouse. It's it's for you. So everybody has a different, different scale. And so if you shade all the, all the areas, then you have some white space and those white space are, those are the areas where you have some, some opportunities and if you've got a lot of white space, you may want to pick out one or two things so as not to be like go, you know, too overwhelming with, with the changes ahead. Um, just pick out one or two, and those are the areas that you might want to focus on. But another um, trick to the wheel is that um, after you do your wheel, you can take out another piece of paper, and, and this time you're doing it based on time, actually. Time well spent. So if you imagine that this is a 24-hour wheel, so now the 12 things actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and think an average day, 
like pick a day, think about a day that you've spent like over the last couple of weeks, like how is your time allocated? How much sleep are you getting? How much time are you working? How much time are you working out? You know, and um, if you draw that and then you set that next to your, your kind of ideal wheel, then you can realize this point about um, where's the time going to come from? And this thing that we said a little while ago, like something's got to give, like if you, if you have this whole white space about um, physical health and you want to prepare for a marathon, but on your actual wheel, there's like not one minute of flex time in your day. Well, it's going to take a lot of time to prepare for, to train for a marathon. So maybe you need to postpone that um, into the future, or maybe you can find something on your current wheel that could, that could give. Hopefully you don't take all this free time out of your sleep time because we know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know that seems to be the <laughs> the temptation absolutely the temptation and um, but sleep is one of those um critical things that that allows us to to recharge to rebalance all all these kinds of things so try not to take it away from the sleep part of your wheel but that gives you a good sense of the, the wheel exercise and this analogy of agency so the you know, this this core element of finding agency self, taking care of yourself. And my aunt was just visiting last week and she reminded me that that my grandma, her mom, had this phrase where she said, and you can be the captain of your ship. And she meant, let's be the captain of your ship in, in terms of health. And, you know, towards the end of her life, she had to juggle a lot of different things and, and really advocate for herself um, from a health perspective. But I love that concept. And I, I feel like I've always lived by that concept and um, in the context of our lives and our careers. And that's one of the core um, topics that we have in the book about, about agency. Wow. Well, that makes a lot of sense going back to that strengths perspective. Yeah. I remember in, uh, I studied sociology in undergrad and that was a big theme in sociology, a sense of agency. How do we, you know, happiness comes from sense of agency and sense of not that we ever have control of everything, but we do have control of our actions. And I think that's, you know, James Clear talks a lot about that in his book, Atomic Habits, you know, don't focus on outcomes, focus on actions, focus on what we, we can influence. And that sounds like a lot of what this is about. It's taking a a, a bird's eye view, right. Of what you want to see happen in your life. That whole, uh, that whole uh, popular phrase, life by your design, right. Yep, that's and then bad. let's let's see what's actually happening, yep. and we're not. It's not a linear process, right? We can idealize and then take a real look at what's going on and try and bridge that gap a little bit with some tweaks, right? Yeah, where things are going. Yeah, it's about scaffolding. My my husband has a degree in education, and he often talks to me about scaffolding in terms of if you want to teach something, if you want to learn something, and you want to grow. It's it's um, you don't just start with like the end goal. You kind of start with where we are. You see where we're trying to get to, and then you take you know some steps and some steps. And so by um, breaking things down into these steps. So if you have your wheel and you have like a white space over here that you want to focus on, we'll figure out you know where am I going to get the time? How can I carve out the time mm-hmm. and to to focus on that? And what what's gonna what can give um, for me to to do that? You know, speaking of agency, one of my kind of insights during COVID was about agency and going into the uh, into the pandemic and writing, starting to write this book. For me, agency was very much a career focused point. It was like, how do you take the steering wheel of your career and thinking about um, all the different uh, steps that you can take to to you know advance through through a career? And I realized during the the pandemic as all of our lives shifted dramatically in so many different ways, how important it was to take that same notion of agency and apply it to, to health and to family and to, to find those areas that you can control. Cause as you said, we can't control everything, but we can um, reframe the situation and we can find those parts that we do, they do control and then kind of try to drive that um, that chip. Something that we talk about in the Rebalance book is um, the the childhood. My favorite childhood book was the Choose Your Own Adventure novels. Did you? Oh yes, I was just talking about that yesterday. <laughs> I yeah. was getting, getting a book with my kid at her school at a book fair, and it was like a modern day Choose Your Own Adventure. I was like, hey, 
I remember that. That's not an original idea. <laughs> it was such a fun one. I remember yeah. as a kid, um, and I talk about this in the book, just like curling up on the sofa and, and reading those choose your own adventure books. It's like, do you want to swim to the desert island in the on the horizon, or do you want to hop in, you know, hop onto this boat and like go where where it's going? Turn to page 22 if you want to mm-hmm. swim to the desert mm-hmm. island. You know, maybe you'll be eaten by a shark, or maybe that was. And you can't peek ahead. It's not allowed. <laughs> you can't peek ahead, exactly. But it's your choice. And so it's right. like finding those places where you get to make the choices. And that's, um, you know, captaining your own ship. Mm-hmm. It's just fantastic. What a great uh, way to frame it. You know, I'm a big fan of time management. And oftentimes mm-hmm. we think of time management as like, to-do lists and oh, yeah. good and bad and self-shame you don't get it <laughs> but time is so much more than that right exactly. we know that time is the only non-renewable resource we have right and so right. we can't really put a value on it but it is a huge huge way to leverage agency as opposed yeah. to like good bad black white but it's more as like what can i how can i manipulate this fantastic resource to create something more meaningful in my life, right? It's that whole 80-20 principle, right? Yeah. The things that really make us happy are probably the 20% of the way we're spending our time. Yes, yes. I love that notion of time as being the, what did you say, the the most renewable resource? The only you, non-renewable resource. Only non, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right? It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's a great common denominator of, human, of, of the human nature, right? The yes, human condition. Yes. It is indeed. And being a, a professional in the field of sustainability, this notion of renewable, renewable energy, renewable resources, that that means a lot. Um, I love the this phrase of time well spent. There's a man who left Google and started a whole movement about time well spent after seeing how we get sort of sucked into our tech devices and you know lose a lot of our time. And um, but that notion of time well spent that, that you're talking about is right at the heart of this this idea of, of the wheel and taking control of our time. And one of the things is the realization, like how am I actually spending my time? And once you realize that, and you know, you get these little reminders on your phone, like how many hours of screen time you've had this week. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you realize and raise your awareness of where you're actually spending your time, and then if you compare that to where you want to be spending your time, you know, you get a, a really big, like wake up call, maybe, you know, a reality check. And the trick is not to let that overwhelm you because for most mm-hmm. of us, um, there's going to be a gap between, <laughs> between absolutely what we're do. And something that I found though, on the positive side is that once you lay all that out, you can find areas where you can get like a two for one special. So for example, <laughs> one of the times when I was doing the wheel with the Thrive mm-hmm. Group you know, many years ago, and my daughter was pretty young, and I wanted to spend more time with her. I also wanted to do more exercise. So this was a time pre-teenage years where she was willing to exercise, you know, with me, with her mom, you know, like mm-hmm. one of us would run, one of us would be on the bike. And I realized that in my wheel at that time, I could get a two for one special and, you know, therefore get some time back in the day by by putting those two together. I love the way you phrase that two for one special There's a thrive tip for you all two right. for one special. Okay. I love it. And I, I, I try and practice that myself. I'll take my kid to the park when I'm at the park, I'll try and do some pull-ups and, and play around and have, you know, have some fun, yeah. but I get exercise at the same time. Right. Or um, maybe a more practical analogy would be like, I, I love podcasts. I love to learn. I love practical yeah. wisdom. And so I always have a, like a AirPod in my ear whenever I'm doing the laundry or watering the garden or, and Yesterday's case, I was trying to tackle a Matilha bush that had overtaken the back of my house. And so I spent the better part of three hours up, uprooting the thing. And I listened to some great podcast episodes and learned a lot in the process. And um, it's what a great way, right? Getting time back. Yeah, getting right? time getting back. Time exactly back. like squeezing the marrow out of life, yeah. you know, like Dead Poet Society. But what are some of your favorite podcasts? And now I'm curious. Oh, I could talk for hours about this. Pat Flynn right? Smart Passive Income. Absolutely love him. Um, Rick Mulready, The Art of Online Business. Amy Porterfield, Digital Course Academy. Um, Sean Cannell, Think Media. Uh, Dave Ramsey, uh, Financial Wisdom. All that good stuff. In fact, one of of Dave's famous quotes is, 
No, tell your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. I think I use that analogy a lot of the time for the way we think about time, right? You're just talking about how easily absorbed we are into the things that are competing for our attention. There's always something competing for our attention. That's especially in today's world. I mean, with marketing and the emails and the ding, ding notifications, right? If it's not social media, it's Turn something else. Off. Turn off all those notifications. You might miss a call. You might be 10 minutes Absolutely. late for a call, but you'll be much happier person. I yeah. promise you that. Put it on do not disturb. In fact, I've made it a point now that I put do not disturb on at night. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, what if there's an emergency? You can set your emergency contacts to override your do not disturb. So oh, yeah. just See, there's on a, that. There's yeah, a tech, yeah. tech, but in the tech, morning, tech. I will leave it on. I will leave on my do not disturb until I've had my first cup of coffee. I've had a little sit time with the wife and I've checked yeah. in with my kids and I've sat outside and stared at the garden for a good five minutes and pet my dog. And then that's I'll turn it off. Really, that's <laughs> a really healthy way to go. That One of the things that, I talk, that we talk about in Rebalance is about boundaries and taking control of your life by setting certain boundaries. And one of the best ways to do that is with time. And uh, one of the stories we say we talk about is one one day Wendy and I, Wendy is the co-author, a co-author and I were walking along in the morning and and on a walk and talk in Rock Creek Park. And she's like, you don't seem like you're in such a good mood. You know, what's going on? It's like, oh, I've already been doing the emails and the calls and the like do you have to do all of that like it's only seven in the morning you know do you have to do all of that before you've even had your first cup of coffee before you've even come and taken this morning walk with me and I was like well yes of course I have to but then when I said it I realized well no maybe I don't have to you know let's start all that when when it's working Mm -hmm. time and exactly what you said so I blocked out the probably the seven to nine or the six to eight part of my calendar so no calls could be scheduled there for me and and that's like the time for the for the bella run you know when i could either be running or taking my daughter to school or what whatever it was and that made a huge difference in uh, it how how i feel starting the day and i love it that that you do all those things pet the dog drink your coffee <laughs> before you know it's like set your own do not disturb time that's Absolutely. a brilliant thing i love that it doesn't happen by accident either. It's been a progression. I'm getting a little better, a little better at it, you know, as I move along. And even like this podcast interview we're doing right now, yeah, historically would have just been thrown anywhere in my calendar. And it would have been a series of back and forth emails about when to schedule it. And I uh, suddenly discovered Calendly and the integration with Zoom and how I can actually block time for interviews to be automated. It's that's getting time back, right? Yeah. But it took me a couple of years to figure that <laughs> the value yeah. of that um I and how that's that. important I that. yeah. yeah i noticed that when i when i signed up for <laughs> for this podcast and i've seen that more and more lately that that people uh, you know have that set up so these are the times when i'm going to take calls these are the times when i'm mm-hmm. going to do my podcast and you know if you want to find me come to my calendar and and come into you know my my world here and i really respect that i think it's great i'm going to i'm going to borrow that i need to figure out how it's to use free. calendar it's pretty easy yeah it's free yeah it's free okay, I can do that. yeah free is good it's, yeah yes absolutely but anything you can do to get time back it also um there's been a lot of research a lot of talk about the importance of creating protecting space whether mm-hmm. that's you're, you're doing the whole um miracle morning ritual uh or if you're doing the your own your own ritual your own thing the importance of protecting time to decompress yeah. you'll be more productive. You'll make better decisions with how you spend your time. If you just spend a little bit of time thinking about how you want to spend your time, right? And I sometimes when I'm talking about productivity with clients, I'll talk about the importance of reflecting and projecting. And that's very much why I love your your two wheels, right? Analogy mm-hmm. and, and, and exercises. Yeah, yeah. I have a similar tool I give out. Um, the clients, it's just, a, a, you know, it's nothing sophisticated. It's just basically a calendar with time blocks. And then at the very bottom, it has like, okay, what do I want to prioritize? And then on the right side, what didn't work and why didn't it work? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, you reflect on the, you know, the, how you want the next day to look like. And then you use that as a, as a litmus test for the next day and so forth. And it just kind of things roll over. I do the same thing with Google Keep Notes. I uh, have a running one major running to do list on Google keep notes yeah. and I just 
slide because you can create anything and turn it into checkboxes, right? And then you can just slide with the little waffle icons, whatever you want to prioritize to the top. It's genius. It's simple, but genius yeah. because I can just eyeball it and say, what do I want to prioritize tomorrow? It's like 10 minutes before I'm like falling asleep. I look at my phone. I'm like, okay, what do I want to slide to the top for tomorrow? Yeah. What's, what's of the utmost importance? And then I'll just put them in order of priority. Like and that way to do list. Yeah. It doesn't become overwhelming. Like, Oh, look at all the things I didn't get done. You know, it it's, Oh, I'm telling my time where to go. So I don't wonder where it went because the second I jump on Facebook <laughs> or your time where I answer to go. that phone, you know, my, your, your brain has a very limited capacity to, to maintain your intentions, unless you're being very intentional about where you want it to go. Right. Yes. Um, yes. Multitasking is a myth. You, we were talking about the myths that we need to bust and yes. multitasking is a myth. My husband was using an analogy for multitasking with me the other day. And he said, multitasking doesn't exist. Think about your attention as being like a beam of light. And the beam of light is a one, one, one direction. You can cut the beam of light. That's multitasking. You can cut it to do this. You can cut it to do that, but you're actually stopping the light. And then when you stop that task, the light is, is back on. So there are, I love all these different tech tips that you have, tech apps that mm-hmm. give you more time in your day. It sounds like it reminds me of the one where you have a recipe and it, you click something and it says, these are the things you need to buy. And these are where they are in your grocery store, <laughs> something like that. So it's like <laughs> right. certain things that can be automated that, that help you get time back. That's a good theme for us here. You also like some about- tools can be a distraction, right? Yeah. Trying to be more productive can actually make you less productive. Like if we make it too complicated, I love simplicity. Like, you know, simplicity is king, it helps with consistency. Yep. Um, so you don't have to overthink things, but there are definitely some tools that help keep things simple for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We were talking about podcasts. A lot of your podcasts sound like they're in the financial space and, and you think about investing and investing applies here because you're investing in yourself. You're investing in building your own reserves, like your cognitive reserves, your physical reserves, you know, your core strengths, your um, neural connections, all, all these kinds of things that allow you to be um, stronger and able to, you know, to to be ready, to be resilient in the event of some kind of big stress event that happens, like, you know, living through a global pandemic, but by investing in yourself. Um, <laughs> one, one of the things that we um, talk about in the book is about, you know, self-care. And there's a reason why you get on the airplane every single time in any language, in any country, they say, put your oxygen mask on mm-hmm. first. There's a reason for that, because if you don't, you are going to pass out. You will not be able to help your kids, your neighbor, the steward. You will be a big, big hindrance. And so sometimes the, taking this like seemingly selfish act is the most selfless thing that you can do. And that's something that we were talking about earlier with these parents, these moms who, who manage to like find ways to self, to, to create self-care for themselves, to find peace of mind. And, you know, one of my favorite podcasts is called Outrage and Optimism, and it's all about mm. climate change. And, and they ask all the, all the guests at the end, you know, are you more outraged or more optimistic about what's, you know, mm. what's happening on the planet? But one of the uh, one of the recent episodes, one of the uh, podcasters was talking about a Zen master called Thich Nhat Hanh, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, but a Vietnamese man who came to France and he has like all these books about Buddhism. But my favorite one is called No Mud, No Lotus, which means that whatever's happening in your life, the beautiful lotus flower, like it needed a lot of mud to get there. And it's, a, mm. it's an image of of, of, you know, how do you turn suffering into, and struggling into something really beautiful? And, and, you know, how do we take all these busy parts of our life and, you know, find that balance? And, and you know, I, I leave that with you. No mud, no lotus. I love <laughs> so, that analogy. You're full of these great visions. I, just, I love it. Yeah, very visual. Absolutely. And so I'm sure there's a chapter dedicated to, to that that premise on self-care in there. So you said there's 12, right? 12, 12. sectors you cover. Do you want to um, maybe 
just kind of quickly review those with us. And so um, we know what to expect as we dive in. Sure. So the book is, is organized around four big parts of our wheel, the work part, the family part, the health part, and the community part. So in, and in each of the four parts, we have three chapters. Why do we have three chapters? Well, there were three authors. So we figured out, <laughs> figured out oh. that we could, we could write it this way. It was actually one of the first struggles that we came up with in writing the book was like, how do you write one book with one voice, with three authors, mm-hmm. with three really different perspectives on the world, three really different voices, but how, how could you do that? You know, my daughter actually recommended, she loves the books where you hear three different, like every chapter sort of alternates the voice. And we thought about doing that for some time. And then we thought probably our readers would get way too <laughs> confused because <laughs> be it was kind of, you know, similar stories, you know, it's not. So anyways, but we, we came up with this, this thing. So for each topic, we, we each kind of took a, took a spin on it. So that's how we get to the, to the 12 in, in this podcast, we've talked a lot about health, I guess, haven't talked as much about parenting or work or community um, in the, um, so I can, you know, I can go any which way. What, what, what interests you today? We can, we can jump well, in. Personally, I feel like parenting, I mean, with the pandemic first, you know, it was, how do you, how do you work from home? And then how do you work from home and not have, you know, manage your kid? My little one was doing kindergarten through zoom and learning to read. Wow. And, and I'm, you know, two, you know, five feet away in, in my home office trying to do very intensive work and, and I've got my my little one wanting my attention and, and just navigating that and the parent guilt. And even as we are getting back to a pseudo or a new normal, there's still that parent parent, there's always parent guilt on some level when you're talking about priorities and time management. And yeah. even as I I try and serve others through this video podcast and making time for that and and trying to fit in self-care, like even taking the dogs for a walk this morning. Do I take them for a walk or do I do some more work? So I have more time with my kid later. And it's just navigating those things. And, and even as a therapist, I really struggle with knowing what is the best use of my time and how am I going to have the least amount of regret at the end of the day? It all comes back to time and uh, time management, time, time well spent. You know, uh, speaking of dogs and and stress and juggling, you know, before I did my very first uh, radio interview for this book, two minutes before, this was last week, by the way, um, I, all of a sudden, my dog looks up to me and like pees on the rug right in front of me. Two minutes of before the first of interview. And uh, I, I told this story as an icebreaker when I got on the radio show and the, the fabulous host who's like, you know why he did that? Like, no, why? Please tell me. <laughs> He's like, you weren't paying any attention to him. I'm like, you are absolutely right. I was doing a million other things. And I'm often in my household um, told that I'm not paying enough attention. I'm not listening. And that's one of these things for parents and kind of the archetypal story about that. One day I was coming home from work to our fourth story walk up in, in Washington, D.C. Probably my head is buried in my phone, typing, typing, typing. And my daughter was trying to get my attention, trying to get my attention. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at some point she says, mom, is it okay if I just jump out the window? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll be right there. And then, <laughs> you know, I stopped, <laughs> we locked eyes and we just like broke down in hysterical laughter. And that is like our family joke, you know, when mom is so crazy that she can't even pay attention to that. But I think that's one of the biggest things I've <laughs> learned from my daughter, who's now a teenager, very articulate. She she um, tells me all, all the things, does not hold back. And I think as a parent, that's one of the biggest lessons is is to really just be there and, and to listen. And I definitely struggle with that almost every day, which is why I try to do these, um, you know, no mud, no lotus, like why I listen to the to the Zen masters and, you know, try to breathe, try to start my day before I even get out of bed to try to do one of those, you know, few minutes of breathing and and all that, that I've learned from from these great guys, like the mindfulness guy and all of this. And, you know, it does help to some extent, (laughs) but I could definitely do better. Yes. That's an ongoing challenge. I think it goes back to that, uh, 
the name of your book, you know, rebalancing. I think it's, it sounds like it's a con is my experience is a constant effort, you know, constant. it takes yeah. uh, a lot of fortitude and uh, insight to pause and say, you know, what was working that's not working now because I feel off balance. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that that image of the balance it's it's a beautiful uh, image for for what we're talking about here and it it comes to the notion of resilience so when i think of resilience i think of a rubber band and you pull it and then it comes back to center if your center is is strong enough and your core is strong enough you'll, you'll come back to center i was saying that recently one of the book talks and a psychologist told me actually it's not about the rubber band and the balance because things are moving it's it's very you know life is dynamic your life is dynamic so you're never going to come back to the exact same place no think about it more as a slinky and like the slinky goes down to the next step and then it reconstitutes and goes mm. to the next step and it reconstitutes so it's something like very dynamic and i'm really curious about that notion of resilience and how to build in the practice of of rebalance. You know, for me, resilience is something that I think came to me from an early age. When I was young, we moved abroad and, and I always had the realization, I always knew that there were multiple realities in this, mm -hmm. in this world. There are multiple ways to see the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that ability to reframe um, is something that it gives you more perspective. It gives you new, new perspectives. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why we want to move abroad um, with my family and we want our daughter to be able to be comfortable in both, you know, the country that I'm from and the country where my husband's from and to always have that kind of adaptability and, and resilience as something that will help in this, you know, really fast changing world that, that we live in. That's one kind of constant that we know there's going to be change and how can we deal with change? So that's something that, you know, it, we think about a lot. There's a lot to be said for that. And that's definitely been my experience. I grew up kind of a um, unorthodox way as a kid. You know, I traveled across California in a motorhome for most of my childhood. Wow. And so I learned, you know, constantly moved to different RV parks, different places and had to make friends. You know, I never went to public school. And so there was just a lot of adaptability there. And I think it's really served me as an adult is because I see change and it doesn't scare me as much because I'm like, this is just a different experience. How do I how do I get familiar with this new experience? And not to say that change is ever comfortable, but absolutely. I think that that slinky analogy you gave of, mm -hmm. and even the term you used at the start of this interview, I think you said calibrating or recalibrating, right? It's not a return to something. It's finding a new center, right? A new true North, right? Of, of what is and how to, how to function more according you know according to the circumstance for all these great words with the re reintegrate recalibrate refresh yeah. re balance you know resilience and i think we're we're definitely onto something with the with yeah. all Absolutely. these and they, they all kind of help um help with change but i mean the the core thing the core element that you just said from growing up the way you did it's that belief that you'll be able to deal with the change so the change may be Hard, but you know that you've you've managed to deal to like live through all these different things, and that gives you the self confidence. And agency is really a self belief that I'm gonna I'm gonna know what to do, or I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna be able to figure it out, and that that's the thing that that gets you that gets a person through. Reminds me of the book by Marie Forleo. Everything is figure outable. Figure outable. <laughs> I love how she makes up words. Um, Absolutely. And so as we're, as we're um, thinking about this, this book, what are some nuggets of wisdom, right? Some touch points that you feel would be most valuable to kind of impart to, to our listeners today? Like, what are some takeaways that you think would help move the needle for anyone listening? Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the to the wheel and the, you know, the wheel and this notion that, that I am the captain of my own ship, whether it's taking control of my own health, my own mental health, my own career. And we can't control everything, but we can kind of be the one sitting at the, at the steering wheel and be intentional about things. And so if there's one message, um, it's this message of, 
of agency and you know see see your life as a choose your own adventure novel there there are many things that we cannot control there are many things that we can't change but look for those spaces that you can and you know kind of relish the relish your ability to to take take those choices because if you do you will build your own kind of self confidence your own sense of agency um, in what you know what what happens next and that notion can apply to any part of your life and and so that's that's kind of the the message that I'd love people to take away from from the book rebalance so get excited about our privilege to make decisions in our own lives to affect change get excited that scares a lot of people a lot of people would rather be stay stuck in what they're familiar with than make change and enter the unknown how do you how do you how do you negotiate that how do you get excited about the possibility for change when it's scary right for a lot of people yeah it is scary it's it's scary thinking of the unknown I think the way that I deal with it is this notion of of the flow and once you're able to set an intention whatever it is like in this case with my family, we wanted to, you know, move to Spain. And we've kind of put that out there and things started to fall into place one one way or the other that that sort of allowed for that experience to happen. And so the opposite of the fear of change is feeling like you're in the flow and like you're you're moving mm-hmm. along and people sort of pop up who can help you in your in your journey and the only way to for that to happen that I'm aware of is to kind of put it out there so like by setting an intention first with yourself to be you know brave enough to tell yourself you know I really want this this thing and then to start telling other people and you kind of open open the possibility to to new things and and that gives you the chance to kind of live your own choose your own adventure novel that it's by by opening that door you know you if you don't ask for it you probably won't get it if you do ask mm. for it maybe you won't get it but maybe you will or maybe you'll get something else that will be you know even better for you at that time so it's kind of being open to the possibility and getting into that kind of you know momentum and the only other thing that i can add there in terms of the flow is like another tool that we use is the walk and talk so when you're walking with somebody next, you know, side by side or eating dinner or driving in the car, like you're going in the, well, not so much eating dinner, but in the car or walking, you're like going in the same direction. And by mm-hmm. um, kind of being in motion with somebody, you are opening up the possibility of seeing you kind of like walking down the path together. And if you combine that with these notions of of your intention and putting something out there, like opening up the possibility, that's something that um, give it a try and um, see see how it goes. I love that. So again, not getting too attached to the outcomes, but entertaining the possibility. Mm-hmm. Entertain the possibility. Yeah. Talk about, yeah. I do like to, to reflect on the, you know, like an artist, right? I'm not an artist. So I might be speaking out of experience here, but, or lack thereof. but when you when the when the artist puts the brush to canvas, right? First, they have an image of what they want to paint, right? It's, I think of change in the same way. When we want to affect change in our lives, first is created in our mind's eye, mm-hmm. and then in our actions. And when you talk about flow, that's really what it is. It's, it's giving permission, right, for your vision to take fruition, and seeing what that feels like without judgment, without expectation, but just to, to allow room for possibility. Right. Yeah. There's something about flow that that has to do with the, you know, the balance between something that's like challenging and effortful and something that's that, you know, is going to um, come easily to you. And it's it's like once you can get the gears in motion, you may get the gears in motion in a direction that you're not as comfortable with, but then you might be able to, you know, rein it back in <laughs> and. Yeah. and Move the other way, but you know, speaking of like this motion and the the mental health, like I would say that for the my co-authors and and myself, one of the things that most kept our mental health 
strong during COVID was going on a walk and talk, like literally every Sunday morning for one hour. We wrote this book um, from you know March of 2020 to March of 2021 by meeting for two hours every Sunday morning and walking and talking and reflecting on the book and our weeks and all these kinds of things. And um, that's the other side of resilience. It's community. Mm. So finding people to share your journey with and who can help you, you know, get through the, the day to day. And during COVID, like it was so hard to be, you couldn't be indoors with anybody outside of your nuclear family, but you could be outside even, you know, social distance walking, um, or in our case, sometimes even talking on the phone. Um, but by building community, which is a big part of um, this book and our Thrive Group and the way this book was written, and that's kind of the ultimate resilience. We talked about things you can do to be resilient in, inside yourself, um, but if you can bring other people into the equation and you know find support, particularly with like dogs and kids, like no mm-hmm. one parent can do all these things. You need like takes a village to get all these things done. And so finding the people around you, even if you don't have family in your city who can kind of come on that journey with you, that is a big, big part of rebalance resilience. Wow, what a way to inspire a book. It's it's like a piece of history, right? Because it's it was created out of the 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 alpha state, that free flow of of shared lived experience during a global pandemic through love community. That. I just I love it. I love it. I love everything about it. So I can't wait to to yeah, dig in myself. River, this like beautiful river. <laughs> yeah. And it, uh-huh. it's coming from, you know, as I mentioned, 10 years of conversations with these mm-hmm. women in the Thrive group, and then a couple of years with the the Momsy group in in San Francisco, and just trying to kind of distill all that down to a number of stories and insights that we could that we could share. So I'm really curious what you think after you after you read it, and uh, what what resonates with you. Absolutely. Well, I would love to have you back on down the road, see how things are going, if you don't mind, and do an Absolutely. update and, and chew on it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Where can, um, where can we send people to, to find your book Learn more about your work? So the good news is that we do have a website and the book is also on Amazon. So the website is um, www.rebalancetothrive.com and you'll mm-hmm. find the link to the book and to our information about how to get in touch with us there. You can also go to Amazon and the book is already ready for pre-order on Amazon. And the book is called Rebalance, How Women Lead, Parent, Partner, and Thrive. So please go there today, order your pre-order your copy, and um, it goes live uh, May 31st. How fantastic. Well, I'll be sure to tie all up in uh, show notes so everyone can find it. And in the description of this, whether you're watching this on on YouTube or listening on the podcast, just look down in the description. You'll find those uh, links right there for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your journey, your experience, and this brainchild of uh, the how to get into a flow state in spite of a pandemic. So much appreciated. And uh, thank you, Patrick. You enjoy yourself and enjoy your week. And it's been a pleasure and a privilege to, to chat with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, there you have it. Another tool to help you thrive. Hey, if you're getting value from this content, if you haven't done so already, be sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends and family to help raise mental health awareness and it helps this channel grow. Also, if you haven't done so and you're listening to this on the Apple Podcast platform, it would mean the world to me if you left a review there. That also helps reach more people to raise mental health awareness. All right, until next time. Make good things happen. Bye-bye now.